Thanks, my wife, Maggie, and the dog. Say hi. <laughs> uh, so I don't know where to begin. So um, this is an interesting talk for me. This is a talk especially for you. And you'll see why in a little bit. What I'd like to talk about is the idea of joy. And I'm not talking about the idea of um, playing a game with, with, um, with your, one of your kids, or, but more the joy that you get when you write the perfect function, when you, um, when you find the perfect abstraction, when you like going to work in the morning, when you have this energy that drives you to be more productive. That's the joy that I'm talking about. You might call it a personal passion, but one of the things that I'd like to do is talk about this topic in, in a shared language. So we like books and we like programming languages, so I'd like to kind of uh, use that as like the cornerstones as we go through this topic together. So back in the day, um, nice job setting, setting me up here, um, Naresh. Back in the day, I wrote this book called Bitter Java. At the time, I was a Java developer. And I was only a Java developer. So how many of you, at some time in your career, have said there's really no difference between programming languages? It's all about the community. Yeah, so that's, so there are other people out there that would be raising their hands too. They say, oh yeah, my, my brother had that idea once, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's the, very much the view that I had. And um, at some point, at some point, I found myself at IBM. Then I saw all my friends leave IBM to join startups. And I saw them become millionaires. And then I said, I, I want to leave IBM and become a millionaire. So I joined a, a startup called, I can, uh, called um, what was it called? It was called All My Stuff, and it was a horrible idea, and it was right before the internet bubble burst, and I went down with that startup. And I thought, I'll go back to IBM, and they said, no, you can't go back to IBM. So um, I said, I can write a book, right? So I wrote this book, and I think it's a terrible book <laughs> with a great title. And if you look at the reviews, you'll see that they say it's a terrible book with a great title. But... This book was put out before the internet was really popular, before Amazon was, was putting books out. And one of the things that happened was that people started talking about why Bitter Java was written, right? They started talking about, oh, this, this book is about, uh, about sticking it to the man. This, this book is about saying, oh, this Java, the evil empire. And it wasn't about that at all. As Naresh said, it was about people making mistakes in, in Java and how to avoid them. But um, the other interesting thing about this book is that for one hour, this book was number eight on Amazon between Hawking's and John Grisham. I mean, for one hour, right? And then it kind of fell, and it kept falling, and it kept falling to, you know, probably it's, it's all-time low right now. Um, but at some point, I, um, I was actually broken out of, the, um, of this funk by a guy named Dave Thomas. And it's okay, you can applaud. I love Dave too. Um, yeah. So Dave is a very good friend of mine. He's actually a mentor. And he gave this, this advice in, in, a, um, in a book called The Pragmatic Programmer. And he didn't give this advice to me in quite this way. You see, I... Um, I caught Dave, who is the consummate British gentleman, at a, at a low moment. He had been giving talks all day, and we were on a train, and we were on a speaking tour, and um, we were on a train going back to the airport, and I kept asking him about Ruby, but in a pretty aggressive way, because I was interested, but I was a little bit afraid. And um, it was coming out as, like, youthful arrogance, and so I kept saying, surely, uh, surely Ruby can't do this the way Java does. Surely it's, not, it, surely it's not fast enough. And finally, the consummate British gentleman, Dave Thomas, said, Bruce, shut up. Do something non-trivial in Ruby, and then we can have a conversation. And I did, and it changed my career.
So, actually, it changed my career more quickly than, I'm, I'm will, than, than I would ever be willing to admit. Probably four months after that conversation, this book came out. And I went to this, this uh, symposium called the Server-Side Symposium. Does anybody remember the Server-Side? Yeah, so this was a hot site for, um, for discussing Java server-side programming. And I was on this, I was featured on the site a lot because I, I used to write editorials, I used to do um, commentaries and things like that. Um, and the reason was that one of, my, one of my good friends was Ed Roman, um, and he was one of the founders of the server side. And um, he, was, he was helping me get started. Well, I was at the server side symposium, which was a conference in Europe, and this reporter wanted to ask me about this book. So this book was really about saying, hey, pick your eyes up. Your Java career is not going to last forever. You know, I guess this was like 15 years ago now, so maybe that wasn't good advice, right? But, um, but the idea was to pick your eyes up. Something else is, is coming, and you need to be paying attention, or, um, or your career could be in, in some peril. And so the reporter asked me a question, kind of a gotcha question. He said, so, Bruce, you think Java is dead, right? And I said, no, 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 nothing could be further from the truth. We'll always be using Java, just like we're always using COBOL right now. So what I mean is dead like COBOL, not like Elvis, right? And so <laughs> the next day, on the, on the front page of the server side, there's this big old quote, capital letters, right? Bruce Tate says, Java, dead like COBOL, right? And so I needed out. <laughs> From Java to Ruby, right? So um, I needed to establish a Ruby business more quickly than I expected to. And one of the things that happened when Dave introduced me to Ruby was um, I'm a dyslexic, and that means that um, I don't process words the same way that you do. The, um, a lot of the symbols are noise to me, and, and they need to get out of the way. And Ruby had this wonderful freeing capability for me to kind of um, disappear into the background where I could focus on the programming problem. And the funny thing about this book was that a lot of American companies were having the same kinds of problems. They were, they were getting lost in all the abstractions and all of the, the ceremony of Java. And we weren't solving complicated problems at the time. We were taking a big fat relational database and we were babysitting that with a, a web-based user interface. And we were writing that same application over and over and over. And you didn't need that big, fat application stack to do it. So funny thing about this book is that in the United States, it wasn't that popular. Because by the time the book was out, everybody said, hey, we're ready for this thing called Ruby. But in Japan, the same thing wasn't true. And the book was, was really important to people in a way that I never really understood. And so I was invited to meet one of, my, one of my idols, this is the creator of Ruby, Matt's. And I love this picture. I, I was just looking for a picture of him. And I like this one because I bet he's been asked that question thousands of times. Why do people love Ruby? And he says, I guess people love Ruby because, you know, whatever. But when I spent time with Matt's um, during that trip to Japan, he ooted, he, he, ooted. <laughs> he oozed this peace, this calmness, this, um, this inner peace and joy that is difficult to describe. And the funny thing about it was the community around Ruby kind of took those, took those ideas to heart, and they started to take on Matt's personality, so much so that there was this acronym. Have you guys heard this before? Minuswan, right? Matt's is nice. And so we are nice. It's wonderful, wonderful man. So I was at this conference, and I'll probably get some details of this story wrong, but I'll go ahead and tell it anyway. 
So this was the first time that I'd ever speak in to more than a couple of hundred people. There were maybe um, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people um, at this Ruby, Ruby World Conference. And most of them did not speak English. So they were Jap native Japanese speakers. And so I had to deal with the translator the first time in my life. And like every young, arrogant speaker, I said, well, I'm going to break all the rules. and I'm going to tell a bunch of jokes, right? So um, I said, I'm going to tell, I told the translator, I'm going to tell these four jokes. And when I tell these four jokes, um, you're, you're going to, you're going to translate them. But if nobody laughs at the first joke, I'm going to skip the rest of them, right? So I told the first joke, and I was really nervous. And everybody laughed. And then so I said, okay, and I got into it. And I told the second joke, and everybody laughed. And then by the time they got to the third one, this audience was rocking. And I'm thinking, I am the greatest speaker of all time. And I got to that fourth joke, and I said, man, I own this crowd. And then I sat down, and Matt's is next to me, and he's looking down and typing. And he has a, a, a little bit of, a, a, little bit of a, a grin and a snicker. And then I asked him what the translator said, and he started working on an email and turning away from me a little bit, which is very much unlike him. And I said, Matt, how did they translate that joke? And he finally turned around and he said, Mr. Tate told a very funny joke. You will laugh now. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a great moment, right? It's that whole audience was joyful because I was joyful, and they were feeding on that. I was the joy. I was the joke. This is very, very mad, right? This very much caught the spirit of the Ruby, of the Ruby language that I remembered. Um, that that people felt joy coding it because the language would get out of the way. This is an example of a Ruby program, and you can see that it reads kind of like English. It had this this great way of morphing around the business problem that you were trying to solve. In this case, building web endpoints. <coughs> So um, it also had this glorious and terrible capability of letting you open any class at every time, at any time, and changing fundamental semantics that were going on inside. Really useful and a really terrible idea, right? Called monkey patching. But I loved Ruby. Beautiful syntax, very low friction. And I loved the idea that I could get started really quickly and there weren't many compilers. And so at this point, I was working at a company called I Can Make It Better. And I was starting to get rolling with Ruby. This was like my fourth or fifth application um, that I built with Ruby as the head guy um, that I built up from scratch. And I would learned some of the tricks, when to cache and when not to cache. By the way, the, the correct rule is never, right? Caching is a deal with the devil, always. But... Um, but yeah, so I was, using, I was using Ruby, and I was starting to second guess this idea, right? Because compilers are there for a reason. And um, so that I can make it better, I started looking for a, a way out, right? I started actually looking for ways to, um, to rewrite the application. So out of my fear, I started researching what the next programming paradigm was going to be and what the next language in the programming paradigm was going to be. I started writing seven languages out in seven weeks out of fear. And then we eventually published the book just to invite others to go along on the journey with me. And I never thought that it would resonate with anyone. I never expected it to sell at all. Um, much less to be famous for it. I mean, some of the code, if you've read it, some of the code in this book is terrible. And um, I'll, I'll tell you, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad after we published it as it was when we first wrote it. But the guy who wrote the foreword for this book is Joe Armstrong. Great picture of Joe. He passed us last year, and I really miss him. He was a good friend. I remember being in Stockholm and 
what are there, about 100 people in this room, maybe a few more? So picture a cafeteria about this size. Picture me sitting like maybe in the middle here, um, middle front, and Joe sitting in the middle back, and me having like the casual conversation, not with Joe, he's way across the room, right? And me making a comment about Erlang's syntax. And then somebody, Joe, standing up in the middle of the room there saying, what do you mean? Erlang has a beautiful syntax. Yeah. So he had this joy about him. But we were coming from vastly different places, right? Because Joe was used to, used to something else. I was used to this ruby thing. And this is the thing that Joe said was beautiful. But he was coming from a different place, right? He was coming from a prologue. And I said, hmm, that makes a little bit more sense now that I know that. And he had this, he had this crazy way of bringing everybody around, of bringing joy into everybody around. Um, his joy of programming languages, his joy of crazy ideas. I remember one year, um, the second year that I've been invited to EUC, the Erlang User Community in Stockholm. I remember Joe saying, Bruce, I think I'm going to learn the jazz piano. I said, what? <laughs> you know, just this crazy preposterous idea, right? And, and so, so he, he had this new huge piano in the middle of this tiny room, right? And, um, you know, he, he could barely play chopsticks on it. And the next year I came and he was playing a jazz piano, you know, not great, but not horrible either, and there, was, there were like dozens of people standing around listening to him. Joe, it was crazy. So the, re the way that I met Joe was when I actually wrote Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. Joe, um, Joe was the first person that I asked to review a chapter. Now, I didn't intend to. I said, I've got this Erlang chapter. I don't know anything about Erlang. I've only been writing it for, for three weeks. And then my, my editor says, why don't you send it to Joe? And I was just terrified, right? So I said, uh, okay. okay. So I, I sent him this. I emailed it to him. And I get this. I hear this, this um, enthusiastic email come back. And he says, oh, you mind throwing in the prologue chapter as well? And I said, great, that's two languages I know nothing about, right? And I'm giving it to the creator of the language. And I didn't hear anything for a while. And then, then I got this tentative note from my editor saying, um, I need to talk to you, right? Because Joe had sent a note to her that's saying, um, I get the sense that this author understands Erlang very well. Not true, not true, right? But I don't get the same sense for prologue. This prologue chapter is in trouble. So I said, what the heck? And I just, I put my pride to the side and I just called Joe Armstrong. And we worked and worked and worked. And, and he was, you know, I picture him laughing and smiling the whole time as he's teaching me prologue um, and, and sharing his joy. And this is some of what was in seven languages in seven weeks. So prologue is full of facts. Like you might have these little facts that says, Velveeta is a cheese, Ritz is a cracker, Spam is a type of meat, and then there's some flavors like um, sodas are sweet, desserts are sweet, and then there are these inferences. So there's a, if a food flavor, if there's a food flavor X and Y, that implies that food type of X is Z and flavor of Y is Z. And so you can make inferences like that, and then you could ask Prolog to ask these questions. Hey, what, what, types of food are meats. And Prologue uh, runs through the possibilities and replies spam and sausage. And then you could even ask about inferences and say, hey, Prologue, what foods are savory? And Prologue will run through those, um, run through those and, and match and, and run through the iterations and find the things that make it true. And say, OK, yes, um, Velveeta, spam, and sausage are savory. But then we got to this, this problem that Joe suggested. I had a, um, a pretty ugly problem. Um, 
but Joe suggested replacing it with the map coloring problem. And he was very patient with me. He probably taught this exercise, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred times. And he probably um, at, at least run this type of program himself um, that many more times. But over time, I came up with a solution. And it was just jaw-droppingly simple. These colors are different from themselves. There's a coloring of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, and Florida such that, and then you just list, you just say the colorings of the individual states have to be different. In prologue, if you ask it, what's a coloring? It comes up with the answer. And when I made this run, Joe was laughing, laughing, because he was sharing his joy of prologue, because someone else was calling what Joe called a prologue moment. And I really miss him. But that wasn't the only language in seven languages in seven weeks. I've since gotten to know a man named John Hughes, one of the, the creators of Haskell. And um, just recently, I got to spend some time with him as he, um, as he came to Chattanooga to host a conference that we ran. And um, he answered this question that somebody asked about, about how he finds Erlang, um, Erlang and Haskell, which have very different philosophies. And I love the way that, that he expresses his ideas here. So I'm very much a fanatic of technology. I love it very much. I love it and very much enjoy seeing that it's finally bearing fruits. See, John loves taking problems and formalizing them and generalizing them so that he can automate them. You know, quick check is a marvelous invention. <coughs> so I was working with, with Ruby at the time, and I was finding problems like this popping up in my code base because we didn't have compiler errors, right? You know, because like if you take a if you take the first element of a list, that might be nil. And then you take the ID of the nil thing, and um, that throws a null pointer exception. And I was starting to hit a wall with Ruby. And it turns out that somebody else was reading seven languages in seven weeks. That was a, a guy, um, a, Brazil, a Brazilian man, currently living in Poland, named Jose Vallon. He's actually the creator of the Elixir language. And so I, I um, jumped on a plane, uh, jumped across the pond, and stalked Jose to, um, to London, where we worked in a conference together. Uh, and uh, we, we shared a lot of moments. And, um, and I decided that I loved Elixir, and, and we started working together on, um, on getting this language adopted. And... Um, so over time, I got to appreciate that the thing that loved that jo that Jose loved about Elixir was that it was explicit, especially the complicated parts. That was very much unlike my experience that I can make it better. So this was one of the most joyous times in my career. We were actually. I mean, think about, think about the audacity of saying, I need something that's not Ruby. I need a language that, that I really feel. And then launching a language to help make your startup succeed. That's basically what we did with, with Elixir. Um, you know, I, I won't say that I was in the middle of the, um, of the development of Elixir, but we, we definitely bet on it really hard and really early. But after a while, I Can Make It Better got acquired. And those joyful moments started coming much more slowly. And I found myself in a bit of a crisis. There's something that you need to know about me. About seven years before, I missed an insurance payment. And I was training for a marathon at the time. And, um, you know, I would run 16 miles. Um, 
I had just run 16 miles. I was, was told that, um, that I needed to get a test, an EKG test, um, to, so that I could be insured again. And um, when I had that test taken, they said, you need to go to the doctor now. So I did. And I found myself laying in a gurney like this, in a hallway like this, and being wheeled into surgery. Not a major surgery, a very minor one, where the incision would be a couple of millimeters. But it seems I had a problem, actually two problems, in this left anterior descending the lad artery, which is called the Widowmaker. That didn't sound like a good name to me. So I woke up in the middle of this surgical procedure, and everybody was surprised that I woke up. But um, to the doctor's credit, I mean, I didn't feel any pain or anything. They had local anesthetic and stuff. So to the doctor's credit, he recovered quickly and started talking me through what he was doing. <coughs> and so he squeezed this bulb, and the bulb injected this dye, and you could see everything get dark like it is in this chart, and you could see this thing that's supposed to be straight turn into an hourglass. So that was the blockage. And then they put this metal tube in. The skinny one is before they expand it. Then they put a balloon in it, pop it out, and then that, that expands and, and um, makes, opens up the, the passage so that um, I've never had any symptoms since. But being a heart patient, we have to pay attention to things like stress. So I'm in this crisis moment. I'd lost my joy. I was really thinking about my mortality because I knew that there's a tight relationship between heart attacks and stress. I mean, there's no denying that, right? And I'm in the midst of one of the most stressful jobs that there is, right? So zooming in on this chart, you know, we're a third from the bottom, which is the worst place to be. And you might say that this is an American problem. But it's not an American problem. It's a world problem. And I think that sometimes we let our joy or we let our stress spill out onto others. My connection with Guido was that um, was also a connection of books. He actually signed a book for one of my mentees, a man named Michael Dosa, who was bullied as a kid, African American gentleman. And Guido was very kind. He signed a Python book and dropped it in the mail uh, straight to my friend Michael Dosa. And this um, this kind, uh, brilliant man has stepped down because um, I believe that so, many, so much of our stress is spilling over onto the creators of the things that we love. So I didn't like what I was becoming. So I packed up my family and we moved to Tennessee. And we did the thing that you do when you want to reduce the stress in your life. We started a business. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good idea yet. I like the logo, though. You like the logo? There's a word grok, right, to understand. I get it. I grok it. He groks it. That I-O is really ones and zeros. So groks, ones and zeros. Understands computers, computer languages. And that's what we're about. So we started thinking about what makes an elite developer. And we built a product and um, way before we were ready, and that product, we put it in front of my mentees, um, and it just didn't work, not like we wanted it to, not without intervention. So we started asking a lot of programmers questions, and we got answers back that we didn't expect. It wasn't 
the, the lessons that made them smarter. So we went back to the drawing board. We found this, this study done at, at UC, uh, University of California at Davis. And they, they did this, this seemingly wild study. They wired people up um, so that you could see the activity in their brain. And they said, hey, I mean, can you imagine having, having all this brain stuff all over you and, and somebody asking, hey, what Beatles single lasted the longest on the charts? I wouldn't be thinking about anything right now. But it turns out that they did. They got curious. And when they did, centers of their brain lit up, and they were the same, the same brain centers that sparked dopamine. Let me say that another way, that curiosity sparks joy. And this was really cool to me. Hey, the answer, learn more. Learn stuff that makes you curious, right? But then there's inevitably the problem of that manager that says, hey, but if you're taking less time to do the same work, isn't that work going to be less? So that's a problem. So we said, let's sit on that for a little bit. Then we started talking to more people. We talked to this place called the Chattanooga STEM School, science, technology, and, and math. Right? And um, we ran across this, this school that had this great computer science success. And I asked the teacher, what's your curriculum? because I wanted to, you know, steal his ideas and sell them, right? And he said nothing. We don't have a curriculum. What we do is we plant, we plant a need. We plant a bug. We give them a problem that is so intensely interesting and curious that they have to go learn to code to solve it. Incredible. Turns out there's some science behind this. So joy sparks motivation. And there's more science that says joy sparks productivity. This shouldn't be that interesting or that new to us, but it, it kind of made a light bulb turn on for me. So that when people say, hey, I'm going to take less time to do work so that I could study the stuff that makes me really curious, right? And then I'm going, to, I'm going to push on that stuff and I'm going to turn on different receptors in my brain. And when I do, I'm going to be a much better developer so that I can do more work. And eventually, that will turn into a surplus. Said another way that learning in this way is sustainable. So that's where we're going. We're basically moving towards being a tour guide for programming languages. You know, partially to kind of jump off, jump off the things that were causing me so much stress and do the things that I love more, like writing, like video, like interacting with users, talking to people like you but partially because it's the right thing to do. Let's say that you want to build a ship. This is one of these quotes that floats around the internet and doesn't have clean attribution, but it rings true to me, so I'm going to read it anyway. If you wish to build a ship, don't divide the men into teams and send them into the forest to cut wood. Instead, teach them to long for the vast and endless sea. So you want to write better Java? Learn some pony. <laughs> this, so Sylvan has very much the opposite approach that Matt's did, and that's really interesting to me. It isn't about getting out of the way. It's about enforcing things and actually building guarantees into the compiler so that we can have 
we can have message passing that's copy free and even with some mutability in it, but it's coded in such a way and the type system is in such a way that if it isn't correct, it won't compile. Said another way, that the thing that gives Sylvan joy is compilers. So I have a challenge to you to make some time. Right? And I'm not saying steal some time from your families. That's the opposite of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is do the hard work of thinking about your business day, about thinking about your business processes, because many of the leaders that are, that are going to be creating companies are in this room. Right? So make time to discover the things that make you curious, the things that you like, the things that you don't like. And I want to close things out with an emotional moment that I had in preparing for this talk. So I was looking for some quotes about the importance of learning programming languages. And I ran into a quote that I didn't recognize at the time. And I want to read it for you now. A Zen master might tell you that to be better at mathematics, you better study Latin. Thus it is with programming. To better understand the essence of object-oriented programming, you should study logic or functional programming. To be better at functional programming, you should study assembler. Today, not only can we read about the ideas, but we can try them in practice. This makes the difference between standing on the poolside wondering whether it would be nice to swim and diving in and enjoying the water. What's cool is that this quote was by Joe Armstrong and it was the foreword for seven languages in seven weeks. The joy is in the journey. 